Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, it is such a delight to be back with you, and I trust that you are feeling blessed in Jesus, and you are growing in his spirit each and every day. And that's precisely what we're going to try to address today, is who is the Holy Spirit? Now, you'll notice I did not say, what is the Holy Spirit? Oftentimes, he is referred to as an it, or a what, but friends, brothers and sisters, he is not an it. He is God Almighty, and he is the third person of the Trinity. But he is so often misunderstood and even more misrepresented. So as we continue in our study of what the Bible says about specific topics, and our first video was on the most important who is Jesus? Because he asked the question, who do men say that I am? And then he asked the more important question, who do you say that I am? And it's important that we understand who Jesus is and who he was when he walked upon this earth. But it is just as important that we understand who the Holy Spirit is because Jesus said, as we'll see in a few moments, I cannot go back to the Father unless I see the Spirit. So in understanding the Holy Spirit, let's go back to the very beginning. I hope you have your Bible with you because we're going to look at a variety of passages through the Bible. And let me say right up front that we could do a series of a, a multitude of videos on who the Holy Spirit is, what he represents, what he does for us, what his purpose is, the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. But without going into great detail in a lengthy series of videos, I want to keep this as simple as possible so that you understand who the Holy Spirit is and what his purpose is for us as followers of the Lord Jesus. So as I stated, let us go back to the very beginning Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And let's read together. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the first thing to note here is that the word God in the Hebrew is the word Elohim. And if you look up that word in a concordance, you're going to see that in the specific passage here, that is used in a plural sense. So in the beginning, God, Father, Son, and Spirit created the heaven and the earth. Now, if we were to turn over to John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning, and by in the beginning, it means all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Now, if you'll go down to verse 14, it says the Word was made flesh. So Jesus is the Word made flesh. So back to verse 1, in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Now we're replacing the word word here because we're told in verse 14, the word was made flesh, or the word became the man we know as Jesus, who was from Nazareth and walked this earth some 2,000 years ago. In the beginning was the word was Jesus, and the Word, Jesus, was with God, and the Word, Jesus, was God. Now we go back to Genesis chapter 1, and we see in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit created the heaven and the earth. And in verse 2, it addresses more clearly the work of the Spirit, because it says the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, if you'll look in that same chapter, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And God said, again, Elohim, 
God said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. And sometimes that's confusing to people when they read that passage, not understanding we see represented here the triunity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's why it says, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Now we also see this in the New Testament if we turn to Matthew chapter 3 and beginning at verse 16. It says, Jesus, standing upon the earth, physical flesh, when he was being baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So we see Jesus the second member of the Trinity, we see the Spirit of God descending upon Jesus, the third person of the Trinity. And then in verse 17, it says, Lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, the Father, the first person of the Trinity, we see here. And so in these two passages, we see the three members of the Trinity all being one God represented in different forms. We see Jesus standing upon earth being baptized, the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and the Father speaking from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, understanding from these two passages and seeing very clearly that God is represented in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now we need to turn to Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. And this is going to tell us what the role of the Holy Spirit is. Now the Father is speaking here and he says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you will be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols, will I cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. So the Holy Spirit of God here is promised to be placed within us so that we no longer walk according to our own will in our own way, but now we walk according to the statutes of God, the desire of God, the will of God, and we will keep his judgments and we will do them. Not because we have to, but because we will want to. Our desires have changed. What we once hated, we now love. What we once loved, we now hate. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 8, and he says, When the Spirit comes, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And so it is the Holy Spirit's work to continue the mission of Jesus now that he is gone. That's why it says in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. Jesus is going to return back to the Father. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Now there are those that say Jesus is the Holy Spirit, but we can see clearly from this passage that that is not true because Jesus says, I'm going to return to the Father, and upon doing so, the Holy Spirit is going to come to earth to rest upon my followers, to live in my followers. And it is only the followers of Jesus that understand the work of the Spirit, that heed the call of the Spirit, and strive to walk in the Spirit on a daily basis. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, For what man knows the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we, the followers of Jesus, have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The reason we have the mind of Christ is because of the spirit that once indwelt Jesus when he walked upon planet earth now indwells us, and the Spirit indwells the Word of God. As we read the Word of God, the Spirit teaches us the truth about the Word of God. That's why we could sit in a room full of the most educated men on earth and not be taught a single thing by them. No matter how much they, they attempted to sway our opinions about the things that are happening upon this earth, we understand as followers of the Lord Jesus that the Holy Word of God is our ultimate standard for truth. And so we conform all our beliefs, all of our ideas, and all of our understanding around the Word of God. And if we're not careful to do this, it's easy for us to be swayed by the majority opinion and to follow our own hearts because if we don't stand steadfastly upon the word of God, upon the truth of God, then every man is left to decide what is true and not true for himself. And this would differ among each of us. But when we stand to the truth of God and what God's word teaches, we're all left to the same conclusion. We either follow God's will and his heart or we follow our own will and our own hearts. And we know ultimately this will lead to destruction. And so addressing who the Holy Spirit is and understanding that first and foremost, he is God equal to Jesus and the Father, but performing a different role. If we turn to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, we read these words. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. So God, in, in his purest essence, is love. Now, if you have a dictionary handy and you want to look this up, the dictionary tells us that the definition of spirit is the non-physical part of a person, which is the seat of emotions and character. It is the prevailing quality or mood. So the prevailing quality or mood of God is love. And as we just read in this definition, the spirit is defined as the emotion or character. So God is love. We're also told that God is spirit. And so the spirit of God is love. Now, when we think about Jesus, when he walked upon this earth and the testimony and record that were given specifically in the gospels, we see the essence of love in its purest form in the person of Jesus. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Now these are people that are centered. Their attention is, is based upon the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, If I have the tongues of men and angels... But I do not have love, or the King James Version says charity, but it's the word love. Then I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, I'm of no use. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I do not have charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. 
And then in verse 4 through 7, Paul is going to define what love is. So he begins by saying love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not vaunt itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love seeks not its own. It is not easily provoked. Love thinks no evil. No evil of anyone at any time. Friends, this is a high standard to live by, but this is what we as followers of the Lord Jesus have been called to obey. Look at verse 6. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 36 and let's look at verse 26 again. The Father says here, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit of love will I put within you. Now again, love in chapter 13 suffers long. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not vaunt itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave unseemly. It does not seek its own. It is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is the spirit that the Almighty places within us. So now we have a desire to mature in these areas of God's character and overall quality rather than walk according to the flesh, which we've done for so many years. So in Ezekiel 36, 26, the Father says, A new heart will I give you, and it is this spirit of love that I will put within you. And I'll take away that stony heart out of your flesh, that heart that only seeks its own. And in its place, I will give you a heart of flesh, a heart of tenderness. And it is my spirit within you that will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Now, as I stated at the beginning of this video, the spirit of God is such an enormous topic that we could spend many videos covering all the details and making this as complex as possible. But again, it is my intention that we, we abide in the simplicity of Christ. And therefore, we abide in the simplicity in understanding who the Holy Spirit is. And the most important thing we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is God God is going to take that piece of himself, place it within us, so now we become the temples of God, we become the residence for God's spirit to live within, and now we walk as lights in a dark world. We become true representatives and ambassadors unto the world around us of who God is. When they see us, they should see God. They should see God in his love manifested unto men. They should see God in us, in the truth that we base our lives around. They should see God in the judgment that we take in our view of this world and its attempt to flee from God. And we realize that those who draw near to God, God will draw near to them. And so taking a very complex and theological study and simplifying it as best as possible, I think it would only be fitting to finish in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. Now, before we can understand verse 22, let's begin at verse 16, because Paul says, I want you to walk in the Spirit, and therefore, if you do this, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, in order for us to understand who the Spirit is, and how we are to walk as followers of the Lord Jesus, Paul is going to first explain what it means to walk and live in the flesh. 
Now he says the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. They're in opposition to one another so that you cannot do the things you want to do. It will always be your desire from the fleshly standpoint to defend yourself, to lash out at others, to think only of yourself and nothing of those around you. But Paul says you cannot do the things that you would. Why? Because that old heart has been removed and you've been given a new heart. And so if you act according to the flesh, you're acting out the impossible for a follower of the Lord Jesus because a true follower of the Lord Jesus has a desire to walk according to the Spirit. And that's what he says in verse 18. If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law or you're not ruled by the old self. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, they're evident, and they are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. These are all sexual acts that, that Paul is addressing. Then he says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, which is envy, wrath, strife, seditions, which is division, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and things like these, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past. Those who do these things, who live their lives according to these ways, these characteristics, that this becomes the prevailing quality of who they are, they will never inherit the kingdom of God. But you, as followers of the Lord Jesus, walk in the Spirit, for the Spirit is love. Remember, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 said, God is love. Well, God is the Spirit. The Spirit is God. Now, the Spirit is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son, nor the Son the Spirit, the Father the Son. Each hold a different office in the triune aspect of who God is. But the fruit of the Spirit is first and foremost love. Well, what is love? We talked about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love never fails. Love does not vaunt itself. Love does not envy. Love speaks no evil. And on and on as we read. But the Spirit of God is love. And so if the Spirit of God resides within us, these are the qualities that we're going to hold dear ourselves and that we're going to exhibit to a world around us that is living in darkness. Not only is the Spirit of God love, but the Spirit of God is joy, true inner joy, not based upon what this life offers us, but based upon the eternal hope of what God has promised us. So the Spirit of God is love. The Spirit of God that abides within you is joy. The Spirit of God is peace. The Spirit of God is long-suffering and gentleness, goodness and faith. The Spirit of God is meekness and temperance. And against such there is no law. Or you will not act out according to the flesh. You will not live according to the flesh. You no longer reside under the authority of the flesh. The flesh has been killed. The flesh has been buried. It's been crucified. And we now live according to the principles of God, allowing the Spirit of God who lives within us to draw us into the deeper characteristic of who God is and allow ourselves to become more like God and less like ourselves. And that's why he finishes in verse 24, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. But if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let everything we say, everything we do, everything we think, especially unto the world that is watching us, let us walk in the Spirit and exhibit these qualities in our lives on a continual basis. And so I want to end today by simply saying, as I've stated before, in trying to present to you the simplest way to understand who the Holy Spirit is, it's important that we focus upon the qualities of God 
and not the gifts of God. And so often, especially as young believers, we're drawn to chase after the gifts of God. But it is most critical that we focus upon the Spirit of God, upon the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and how we can become better followers of Jesus. So as 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 tells us, He that says he abides in Jesus ought himself also walk even as Jesus walked. And in order to do this, we must allow ourselves to be conformed into the image of God by allowing his spirit to have full control in our lives so that we walk not according to the flesh, but we walk according to the spirit. Well, once again, friends, brothers and sisters, I am so grateful that you have decided to take some time to participate in this study with us. And I pray that you'll continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ each and every day, and that you'll walk not according to the flesh, but you'll truly understand who the Holy Spirit is in you and what his desire is for you. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.